Hey there, welcome to part one of my July wrap up. In today's video, we are going to be talking exclusively about South American literature, so I hope that that will be of some interest to you. So, I noticed that kind of around a third of the way through the month of July, I was really starting to feel a little sad that I really had no plans for this summer, and obviously, I don't have any vacations booked, you can't really go traveling right now. So, in order to make myself feel better about that situation, I thought I would plan a literal Literary vacation for myself where I would just read a bunch of books from one part of the world and trick myself into almost thinking like I had gone there on vacation and I know it sounds kind of lame but it did actually work I had a lot of fun reading South American literature for about 10 days and I'm obviously not deluding myself that reading about a part of the world is like the same as going there but you still get these really cool glimpses into the culture into the landscape and people and I just learned a lot and had a lot of fun. I ended up picking South America as the destination for my fake literary vacation because it's a part of the world that I've never been before but I would just love to go and see someday. Also because it's summer here in Canada where I'm living the weather is kind of more sweltering than usual so I thought the heat and humidity would kind of fit along with some of these books. Also I just have a great affinity for South American literature. I don't exactly know why but I feel like South American literature just always sets my imagination on fire. It is so much fun to read and I end up learning a lot and this week was no exception I really enjoyed all of the books that I checked out for my mini literary vacation So in today's video, we're going to go through each of the countries that I was able to visit Starting off with the one book that I read from Colombia two books that I read from Chile three books that I read from Brazil and five books that I read from Argentina to start off with Colombia, I read The Story of a Shipwrecked Sailor by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, translated by Randolph Hogan. And this book is pretty much what it says it is. It's a work of journalism and Marquez is transcribing the story of a sailor who fell off of his ship and had to survive for many days out on a raft in the ocean in really brutal conditions. So it's not very long and it's just kind of a straight up survival story. I will say that it made for a pretty good one sitting read because you just kind of need to make sure that this guy is going to get off the raft and be okay. I did learn a little bit more about what it's like to survive life out at sea. I feel like in some ways this challenged a few of the stereotypes of a survival narrative. Like a lot of times you'll find that people get so hungry in these situations that they like lose their humanity and they don't mind murdering anything just to eat. And the sailor in this book really felt disgusted at any point when he had to try to kill birds or anything. Like he did not find the process of doing that appetizing and he really had to fight himself to do that. And I also enjoyed the depiction of sharks and I didn't know that they were so punctual because at the same time every day they would kind of show up and start circling around his boat which was really stressful. But actually the most interesting thing about this book is the preface at the beginning which Marquez wrote and first of all it was a very weird move but he was like I don't really understand why this is being published as a book. He only seemed to think that this was being published as some kind of cash grab because he's like a more famous writer so he was very skeptical about the whole thing which is a move to put at the start of your book like I don't really think that this is that good <laughs> and he also shared the fascinating story about what happened to the sailor after he became kind of a national hero for sharing his survival story well it turned out the government did not love what he had to say about how the ship sank. He went against what their narrative was because it turns out the ship that he was on was carrying contraband merchandise. So the government wanted him to change his story and he wouldn't. And they basically kicked him out of the military, ended his career, and he ended up in great poverty. So it was a pretty sad story. But again, all of that happened in the foreword and not in the book itself. So even though Marquez didn't think that this was worth republishing, I thought it was quite an entertaining way to spend an afternoon. Next up, I read had two books written by Chilean authors, one of them I absolutely adored, and that was Multiple Choice by Alejandro Zambra. So this book is pretty unconventional in its form. It is written like a standardized test. It has a few different sections, each of them testing a different type of reading comprehension skill. And this is kind of modeled after the standardized test that many Chilean students have to take in high school. And I actually ended up really enjoying the test format for this book because it was a very participatory experience for the reader, which you don't always get to do with the books that you're reading. I mean, you have to act 
actively participate because you're constructing the meaning of the text along with the author. How you interpret the story is going to depend on which multiple choice answer you're going to choose yourself and I really liked how this book invited that action from the reader so that made it really fun to participate with. I also hate multiple choice tests and standardized testing in general especially when it comes to literature. I think the whole value of literature is that every reader is able to interact with the text in their own way and draw their own conclusions and come up with their own interpretation but multiple choice tests don't really allow for this kind of difference in interpretation. In this kind of test there's just one correct answer and they want everyone to kind of shut off their critical thinking skills so that they can arrive at the same point. So what does it really say about a country's educational system when they are prioritizing students to come out who all think the same way? It's kind of weird. So I feel like this book does a great job of making some very valid critiques about the educational system in Chile but also this book is just always very fun and playful and really funny in a lot of points. Like some of the answers that he comes up with for the multiple choice will have you laughing because they're kind of ridiculous and silly or it just gets really intense or serious out of nowhere. So this book is not just being like angry and railing at the system but it's just always playful and sarcastic and just like weirdly funny. I also really enjoyed the section at the end of this book that gives you three different standalone short stories and then gives you some questions about them at the end. I liked seeing what Zambra was doing with his writing given a longer form and it has made me very excited to read more of his work in the future because I thought this was just a really innovative but fun reading experience. The other Chilean work that I read was By Night in Chile by Roberto Bolaño, which was translated by Chris Andrews. I forgot to mention Multiple Choice was translated by Megan McDowell. Anyway, the only other Bolaño text that I've read before is 2666, which is quite long and super intense and dark. So I was kind of curious to see what Bolaño would do with the form of the novella. I was curious to see what his writing would be like in a shorter dose. And I quite enjoyed this and I think that it was really well crafted. But essentially this book is revolved around the dying thoughts of a Jesuit priest named Father Uruccia. And he's just kind of looking back on his life and trying to make sense of everything that has happened to him. One thing that I thought was interesting about this priest is that he really didn't write that much about religion or the church. In fact, this priest's passion seemed to be literature, especially Chilean literature. Like he is just a very passionate, active participant in his country's national literary scene. He enjoys reviewing books. He enjoys traveling around the world. So that kind of challenged my expectations for this book. I thought since it was about a priest, it was going to be more about that kind of part of himself but it does really show you that priests are still like complex human beings that have other things going on in their lives of course so I thought that he was a really compelling character to read about. Bolaño did a great job of being very evocative when he was describing this priest's memories throughout his life. A lot of the scenes in the first part of this book are kind of lush and very descriptive but the book gets kind of darker and more morally ambiguous towards the end especially when there's the military coup by by Pinochet and he's asked by some higher up people in that government to educate some key military figures about socialism and Marxism. So the priest is kind of interacting with these key figures involved in this dictatorship. So he kind of has to start asking himself these questions about why his students are coming to him for this knowledge, what they're going to do with this knowledge, and kind of what his impact as a teacher is going to be. So this asked a lot of provocative questions and I think shows you some of the difficulties of what it's like to live under one of these dictatorships. Zambra's text as well is also haunted by this specter of dictatorship and how it really takes over everyone's lives and imaginations and the kind of effect that that can have on people. So I kind of liked how both of these books were addressing these themes in really different kind of ways. But yeah, I thought they were both well constructed. Now this one, this might be a deal breaker for some people. It is written in just one paragraph. So I know that that is a writing style that not every reader is going to love because you really do need to give a lot of time to immerse yourself into the rhythm of the prose when it doesn't have those natural stopping points. 
I found that after reading The Unnameable by Samuel Beckett, <laughs> my patience for a lack of paragraph breaks has been greatly improved. But anyway, yes, I greatly enjoyed both of these books that I read from Chilean authors. Moving along to Brazil, I read three books and they are all quite different from each other. I have a collection of stories that was mostly written in the late 1800s, a novel from the mid 1900s, and a graphic novel from the 2000s. So let's start off I guess talking about the graphic novel. This is Day Tripper by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba, who are twins. They both illustrate and write their stories, which how cool is that? And this is a graphic novel that I have been excited about reading for such a long time. If you ever look up lists of what are the best standalone graphic novels, this text is always bound to show up on those lists. I've heard such great things about it. And I've been kind of saving it for a special occasion, so I'm glad that I finally treated myself and read this during July. This is one of those graphic novels where I can truly say that the artwork is just as beautiful as the story itself. It really is a stunning book to look at, especially if you want to see different locations. In Brazil, you will fall in love with the landscapes that you see in here. But it's also such a powerful story about kind of how we as humans end up defining our lives. When we first meet the main character of the story, he's kind of like a young guy in his 20s, and he's wondering when his life is truly going to begin. This idea that we all are destined to live some kind of cool story, and at some point in our life that story is going to start, and everything that we do is going to start mattering. And I think that that's something a lot of us believe, maybe because we watch a lot of movies or TV shows where we're kind of fed this idea of narrative because obviously every day of your life matters, every day counts, <laughs> but we kind of think that only certain moments are going to be more important than others. However, this book is also exploring how your death ends up influencing and impacting the story of your life because it's going to make a really big difference if you die as a child versus if you die as a father with your own children. Who you are as a person is almost fundamentally changed and defined by how and when and in what circumstances we end up dying, which is a really heavy thought to think about because we don't oftentimes have a lot of control in how we die. So this book is kind of exploring and taking a look at how that could play out in different scenarios. So I thought it was just a really fascinating story to think about. Like it really did affect me on that emotional level and it made me re-examine my own life. But it was also just gorgeous and fun to interact with as a story. I loved the settings and I loved the characters and I thought these two did an outstanding job telling a really powerful story in Day Tripper. Next up, let's talk about the book that I have no idea how to talk about. <laughs> and that is The Passion According to G.H. by Clarice Lispector, translated from the Portuguese here by Idra Novi. This is a book that I feel like you just have to experience it on your own. You don't want to sit and listen to someone else describe it for you. It is an experience. It is like a full body, mental, physical, spiritual experience. It's a slim book, but don't let that fool you. This book is kind of notoriously well known for containing a scene involving a cockroach and certain disgusting things that have to happen to said cockroach, but it's about so much more. You know, it's not just about Haha, <laughs> a gross thing happens with a bug. Like, this book is like tearing apart the fabric of reality as we know it. So I think it's kind of a mistake to just trivialize this book by talking about its kind of gross moments when really I think this is such like a large-scale ambitious project. And I think this is something particularly that Clarice Lispector is just really good at doing because I've noticed a similar pattern in a lot of her short stories. These stories usually involve a woman just kind of going about her day very casually. She's usually doing some kind of mundane chore and she's not expecting anything exceptional to happen, but then she sees something. And that something has some kind of weird profound shift on her and reality just dissolves and completely warps and she's thrown into this really strange, unrecognizable, chaotic world. And the thing with Clarice Lispector characters is that they don't just pass that over and think that that was weird and then go back to their surface life. They really dive into those moments and they use them as these tools to examine their self and like 
expose the illusion that their lie is. And I know that this all sounds very cryptic, <laughs> but you just kind of have to read her books to get it. And usually the thing that triggers this whole eruption of reality is something that's pretty small. So in this book, it was the little cockroach on the wardrobe. In one of her short stories, it was like a blind man who was chewing bubblegum on the streetcar. So really, it doesn't matter what it is, but just sometimes we have these catalysts that just change everything for us. And in this book, the character, like I said, just really leans into this moment of change. She's not just going to walk away from the cockroach and go back to normal. Uh, she is going to experience this shift in the present, in the reality, and she's going to go with it and it's going to change her forever because she really does realize that her whole everyday life is kind of a lie. We live on the surface of experience. We don't really feel things truly and deeply in this kind of primal, powerful way in our everyday lives in civilization. And I feel like Clarice does such a convincing job of showing us how much weird raw brutality there is under the surface of life that just most of us never get to experience. So I don't know if any of this made sense, <laughs> but I would highly encourage you to check this one out. It is just mind blowing in every sense of the word. And then the final Brazilian book I read was 26 Stories by Machado de Assis. And this was translated from the Portuguese by Margaret Jewel Costa and Robin Patterson. So the only other book of his that I've read before is Dom Casmura, which was a very intriguing book to me because it seems so fragmented and kind of twisted and bitterly ironic. So I was very intrigued with his style and I wanted to read more of him. Now the short stories were more pleasant than I was expecting. This collection does span through his entire career as a writer, but I will say there is something satisfying about reading short stories written from the 1800s and that time period because I feel like for modern short stories it's not really cool to like tell a story with a short story. You're kind of supposed to like prove something about your writing or you're trying out a narrative technique, but it's usually not about good old fashioned storytelling. Whereas I feel like older short stories get the job done. Like they're just satisfying narratives and you just meet compelling characters and they were just pretty entertaining for the most part. You can tell that Machado has a very playful sense of humor. His narrative voice is warm and engaging, but he's not afraid to poke fun at his characters in these very subtle and funny kind of ways. However, one of the stories in here called Father Against Mother really stood out for being a very dark and disturbing, brutal look at slavery in Brazil. And quite a few of the stories actually in this collection do casually mention slavery, but this story in particular is from the perspective of a man who is a slave catcher. So he's earning his entire income from trying to capture people that are trying to live a free life and returning them to their life in slavery. And the main character of the story doesn't really see himself as a bad figure. You know, he thinks that he's just a good guy who's doing what he can to provide for his family. But it turns out he's not doing that well at it. He's not making a lot of money. And there's one point in the story where he's going to have to give up his one and only child. And he's about to take this kid off and take him off to the orphanage. And then he encounters a runaway slave woman who is pregnant and he goes after her. And he tries to turn this woman in in exchange to get his own son because he knows if he gets a reward for her, he doesn't have to give up his own kid. And it was just so creepy how the man in the story doesn't really feel bad for ruining this woman's life, taking away her freedom and ruining the life of her child as well. He doesn't really feel bad about what happens because he sees himself as the good guy, as the protagonist of his own story. He's just doing a heroic deed that he needs to do to save his family. And he's really just putting himself and his family over over the lives of other people, which I think is a really condemning look to show us how oppression works in many societies. It's not really about being mean and hating the other person. It's just you're looking out for yourself and your own people first at the expense of other people. So I thought that story was really powerful and it was totally worth checking out the collection for that story. But there were also many others that were just very fun to flip through on a summer afternoon. And finally, the last country that I was able to visit on my literary vacation was Argentina. So I was able to read five books and let's talk about them in the order of favorite to least favorite, even though I pretty much enjoyed all of them to some extent. So the best book that I read was Santa Evita by Tomas Eloy Martinez, which was translated by Helen Lane. Side note, but I feel like it's so helpful when the translator's name is actually listed on the front cover. I feel like this needs to be standardized, you know, it's very just helpful and polite. Anyway, this book is all about the weirdly bizarre 
true story about what happened to Ava Perone's corpse after she died. It is a weird, wacky tale. This is one of those cases where truth is just stranger than fiction. This book exists at this weird intersection between fiction and nonfiction, where you're really never sure at any point if what you're reading about really happened or not. But the author is setting it up like he is interviewing all of the key players that are showing up in the story. So it is kind of journalistic in style. You are introduced to these characters and oftentimes they are telling the story in their own kind of voice. But really this served to be quite a complex and fascinating portrayal of Eva Perone. Now going into this I actually didn't know that much about Eva Perone. I haven't even seen the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical about her so I really enjoyed learning more about her backstory and just the sensational journey that she went on to go from being this kind of obscure girl in the country to being an actress to being the first lady of a country and it's almost about how she transcends personhood in the way that some celebrities do because she's almost not really treated like a real human being at a certain point. She's more this like deified idol and that extends into her death where most dead people just want dignity. We just want to be buried but Eva is denied this dignity. She is embalmed. She is treated like this strange doll by so many people that she encounters. It's creepy. She's viewed as like a political possession that's almost like a chess piece in some kind of sick game and it's just very strange and sad to see how her personhood and agency is like taken away at so many points in this story. This story is just again it's just also very strange to follow because there's almost like a curse involved with her body. Wherever she seems to go misfortune follows and most people who end up interacting with her corpse end up becoming weirdly obsessed with it. So it's just bizarre book but I think it is really well constructed. It's told in this compelling kind of way. It's very mysterious while also trying to be truthful and I think it is ultimately a compassionate look at Evita and who she was and what she meant to this people at this time. So it's totally worth checking out. If you don't have enough time to read this whole book though and you want more about the story of Eva's corpse you can also check out the highly informative video on the Ask a Mortician YouTube channel. Uh, she did a whole video about this that I will link down below if you want more scoop on this truly wild story. Next up is another collection of short stories and that is Blow Up by Julio Cortazar translated from the Spanish by Paul Blackburn. So you know how I was kind of saying that there's something that's almost like warm and comforting about old-fashioned short stories because they're just kind of telling you a normal story and these ones are very much not that. These are existing in that kind of modern sphere. They are experimental and they are disorienting as heck when you're starting out reading these because it's kind of like Cortazar is not giving you key information at the start of the story. So you're just kind of dropped into this world. Things are strange. The rules are being broken, but you don't really have access to the full story and it's kind of just you as the reader trying to piece together different pieces of the puzzle so you have a full glimpse of what's happening at the end which I'm not always sure I was successful at like a lot of these <laughs> remain mysterious to me but I did enjoy that process you have to be in the right mood for it you know you have to have your brain turned on and ready to go and think but I did enjoy quite a few of the stories in this collection especially the first story in here called Axolotl that one is a game changer for what the short story is able to do and it will also change the way that you see these little animals. You know before you thought they might have been just like cute and sweet but now they are just very creepy and ominous because I've read this story. There is also like a strange one in here about a man who has this weird condition where he vomits bunnies sometimes and it's kind of this uncontrollable thing that happens and typically it doesn't happen to him very often so he's able to hide it and it doesn't cause problems for him but then in this part of his life it's happening more and more. So like a lot of these stories are just bizarre in their premise but they're really fascinating and they're really interesting. So I just like how Cortazar's mind works. He's a strange guy. I had read his novel Hopscotch before and was again really impressed with what Cortazar is able to accomplish with his prose. However, in that book, I really did not like the main character of that story. So that certainly tarnished my experience. So it was cool to give his writing another chance when he's writing about other characters in different circumstances. And I really do think that he is just a masterful figure of South American literature. He does such strange and interesting things but you will not forget a Cortazar story after reading it. 
Next up was Come Madre by Roque Laraque, which was translated by Heather Cleary. And this is a quite short book that is made up of two short stories. One of them is kind of on the longer side, it's around 100 pages, and it was the greatest. It was so creepy and strange and it actually freaked me out when I was reading it late at night. The second story in this is shorter, it's more of like around 40 pages and it deals with some similar themes and elements to the first but it's in a different setting and time period and unfortunately for this collection is the second one didn't really work as well for me. So it's one of those like unbalanced things where if I just read the first 100 pages this would be a full out five star experience for me but then you read the second one and it was just like wasn't as good, so you didn't really end on that strong note. So that's, I guess, one of my issues that I had with this book. But let's start off by talking about the first story that makes up this collection. It's set in the 1800s in a sanatorium outside of Buenos Aires, which, if that doesn't creep you out alone, what's even creepier is that the author got the idea to write this story based on a real advertisement that he saw for the sanatorium, and there are like some sketchy things that are kind of written in here that he uses to inform his own story. So it kind of has that weird tenuous connection to reality that makes it that extra bit creepier. Also, the doctors in here are kind of experimental and unethical. They've decided that they want to investigate what people learn at the end of their lives right as they're dying. So they've made this kind of procedure where essentially they can guillotine people's heads off and then they're interested in recording what people are going to say for those seven seconds that they have while they're still alive but they don't have their head attached to their body. And they have to go about this experiment in many different ways. They have to ask, you know, should you tell the person in the experiment that they're going to be killed or not? Will that change what they say? Should they know about it going into it? Like there's just so many creepy, weird scenarios going on in this story. The doctors are just like horrifying people. You know, you get into a bit of their personal life and their drama with each other, but it's just kind of that chilling view of medical science where they are able to detach the humanity of their patients because they are so obsessed with their research and the findings that they think that they're going to get, which they do think will better humanity, but again, does that really justify what they're doing? No, so creepy. So that story was just bone chilling and I couldn't put it down while I was reading it. The second story in here is from the perspective of an artist who is trying to do like edgy performance art pieces, but my criticism with this is that I feel like art is never as fun to read about because I think so much of the power of performance art is like the visceral impact of what you're seeing that it just never really seems to work that well for me when it's described in fiction. So it's an uneven collection but it's still so worth checking out especially if you like creepy weird stories. Another strange heavily atmospheric book that I read was People in the Room by Nora Long and this was translated by Charlotte Whittle and this version features an excellent introduction by Cesar Ira, who is another one of my favorite Argentinian writers. So this book is kind of like a strange coming of age story, sort of. It was first published in 1950. And it's about a girl who notices that she has some strange neighbors who are living across the street from her. She's able to look in on their drawing room one night and she notices these three ghostly looking pale women that are just sitting there and she gets kind of obsessed with who these people are, what their deal is, and she wants to start to kind of like cross over and to meet them in real life. Now apparently the imagery that inspired the vision of these three women in the window comes from the painting of the Bronte sisters, which is kind of creepy and spectral in nature. And this book just has you guessing the whole time whether what's happening is really happening or if it's just something that's going on in this young girl's imagination. It's kind of hard to tell what that line is between fantasy and reality, which I think is something that will frustrate a lot of readers if you're expecting it to lead to this kind of climactic moment or if you want resolution to the story. We don't really get that. It is much more about the experience as you're going through it and the atmosphere that this book is able to conjure. In fact, I think it's one that you probably have to read twice. Like I know that I would get a different experience from the story going through it a second time, having fewer expectations on the plot and paying closer attention to this main character and what she's actually thinking. But what I think this book does exceptionally well is painting the power of imagination that you have as an adolescent. I can speak for my own experiences in my adolescence. I definitely lived a lot in my imagination, you know, where you kind of imagine 
imagine people and things, you know, things you maybe haven't experienced for yourself yet, because you do have a lot of uncertainty about your future and what's going to happen to you. Your imagination is kind of a space for you to think about what you're going to be and what you're going to do in this kind of safe sort of way. However, it has the power of almost taking over your real life and affecting you and preventing you from engaging fully with what's happening in front of you. So I feel like this book does a great job of really transporting us to the mental space of the main character and it's a perspective that I don't see developed all that often in a lot of literary fiction. So I liked that. I also thought the three women across the street were just like quite creepy. So the atmosphere of this book worked for me and it gave me a lot to think about after I finished reading. And then the last book that I read from Argentina is a modern classic, and that is The Seven Mad Men by Roberto Arlt, which was translated by Nick Kester. So, this book. Once again, I'm going to use the word strange because I don't know what the heck this was. <laughs> but essentially, this is about a deeply unhappy, unsatisfied man who gets fired from his job because he has been embezzling funds. You know, he's been trying to steal money to make a better life for himself. He gets found out. He gets fired. His wife ends up leaving him and he is just kind of at this all-time low in his life. And he makes friends with some shady characters who also happen to have revolutionary ideas of how they want to get rich in this mining expedition and take over the government and just reform society. So there's a lot of these wild revolutionary things happening in here. Also, the main character decides that he is going to commit a crime so that he can fund said revolution. And it's kind of leading up to this crime. He's thinking a lot about what it's going to be like to commit this crime, how it's going to change him, if it's going to change him, and all of that interesting stuff. So you're in a really dark and unhappy headspace throughout a lot of this book. It reminded me a lot of Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. You know, you're concerned with the ethics of this situation and how that affects the main character mentally in a not positive way most of the time. There are some funny moments. Like you can tell that Roberto Arlt is certainly a sharp observer of society. The way that he paints life in Buenos Aires at this time is very vivid. It's just not pleasant. Like he's showing you all of the disturbing elements of society at the time, which I think there's some value in that. You know, he is writing about pimps and prostitutes and criminals and people who the system is just really failing. So I think that there's some importance in taking a look at that and why society just doesn't seem to work for every kind of person and there are just oftentimes so many deeply unhappy people just going about their day-to-day -day lives and what happens if they do turn violent because of that. So this book gave me a lot to think about. I'm not sure if it was a necessarily enjoyable <laughs> experience. Also my other major issue with this book is that this is clearly just part one of like a two-part work. Like there are many references throughout this about things that are going to happen in volume two. So I think it was kind of strange that New York Review of Books published volume one but then just never got around to publishing volume two called The Flamethrowers. I did more research online about said volume two. Apparently it was just translated by a guy who's not really a professional translator. He just really wanted to read volume two so he taught himself Spanish to translate it. So it's kind of like a chaotic translation but it has been put out by an independent publisher but it's also really expensive you know if I were to track that book down and get it shipped to me in Canada it would be pretty costly and I don't know if I care enough about the story to really pay that kind of money to read book two but again I just think that that's an odd choice for the publisher because I feel like I just haven't fully experienced the scope of the story I think a lot of what happened in part one is going to change based on what we experience in part two like the story has only just begun I feel like so I don't really feel like I have a full sense of what this work is just having read The Seven Mad Men but I will say that even though the plot feels a bit unsatisfying when you're not able to finish the story with volume two at least you are introduced to quite a vivid cast of characters in this book. I also think the psychology in this book is complex as well as the depictions of a grittier side of Buenos Aires in the 1900s so it was worth checking out I just wish that it was easier to find volume two. 
And then finally, I have one last bonus book. So this book is not actually written by a South American author, but it is primarily set in South America. This is The Adventures of Alexander von Humboldt, and it was written by Andrea Wolf and illustrated by Lillian Melcher. Now, Andrea Wolf actually wrote a full biography of Alexander von Humboldt called The Invention of Nature. I checked that one out a few years ago, closer to when it came out. And this is kind of taking some of those main concepts from the biography and just putting them into a lovely graphic form. It's showing you Alexander von Humboldt, who was a German scientist, how he traveled throughout South America. He went on many different adventures and he contributed a lot to what we now know about science and the natural world and how everything is kind of quite interconnected. He was definitely a big picture thinker and he's had quite a big influence to many natural scientists who have followed after him. So I thought it was a really fun idea to put his adventures into this graphic novel format. It was just a lot of fun to flip through and it's quite cool because like when you see leaves like these, these are apparently real samples that Humboldt brought back from his trips that are preserved um, as well as you get to see what his notes looked like. So there's a lot of authenticity to this. Obviously the places that he traveled to in South America are gorgeous. So it was such a treat to see some of the landscapes that he saw, the rivers that he traveled through or the volcanoes that he climbed. He really was quite an exciting guy who did get into a lot of adventures. One thing that I think didn't work that well about this is that Alexander von Humboldt is telling his story in the first person and for some reason he's kind of omniscient and he's able to see his influence and how important he's going to be after he dies but he just kind of comes across like he's bragging because he's you know just talking about how great he is and how Darwin and everyone after him is like so in debt to his ideas. <laughs> so I thought in a biography it kind of makes sense to talk about how important he is but when he's just the person that's trying to tell you all of that information in first person it just comes across like bragging and it's just a bit off-putting. Another thing is that I think because Wolf had this whole biography and she spent so much time researching Humboldt, she just has a bit too much information that she wants to shove in the story. So I do feel like this could have been a bit less text heavy. But still, this is a really fabulous graphic novel. It's a great way to learn about Humboldt if you've never heard about him before. Even for myself, having read that biography, this was a nice refresher on that content. He really is a figure that is worth checking out. And of course, for the stunning vistas of South America, this was a really fun read to check out. So that's it for all the South American books I read in the month of July. Please let me know if you have ever planned a literary vacation for yourself. That will make me feel less alone in my weirdness because I thought it was really quite thrilling. It was a lot of fun to go on this fake vacation. You know, it obviously is not as good as the real thing, but you got to get creative in this new and limited world. So let me know if you've ever planned a literary vacation for yourself. And if you haven't, where is somewhere that you would like to travel to through your reading? Thanks so much for checking out this video. Part two will come later and we can talk about all the other stuff that I read in July, but that's it for today and I'll see you later. Bye.